Let's, let's look at Psalm. We're going to look at Psalm 29 today. And forgive me, I'm going to try not to cough on you. I'm not, I promise it's not COVID. It's just seasonal gunk. And so um, if I stop and cough, forgive me. Uh, I hope my voice will hold through uh, all of this. It should, probably. Uh, so we're going to look at Psalm 29 today. I'm going to pray for us real quick, and then we'll do what we uh, Maybe look at some, some general comments about the psalm, and then we'll work our way back through, just piece by piece, looking at the psalm, trying to pick different types of psalms. Um, so anybody want to remember, what are the psalms we've done so far? Psalm 1. Psalm 3. 31, I believe, is what Ben did with you the week that I was out. Uh, and then, that's it, right? Yeah, because this is week 5. Uh, next week is week 6. There will be a one-shot after that um, where we'll all be together in the sanctuary, and then the new cycle will start on on October 2nd. There's probably a faster way to do this. There we go. All right, let me pray for us, and then we'll, we'll dive in. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that it's true and good and right. Uh, we ask that as we uh, come to it now, that you would give us uh, eyes to see and ears to hear. Give us wisdom as we read your word. Help us to not just understand it, but to apply it to our lives, to be moved by it, to be changed by your word, uh, that you would take your word and by your spirit shape and mold us to look more like Christ. Uh, Father, we confess that uh, we, we will want to hide from the truth that your word gives us, the ways that it convicts us, and we ask that you'd help us not to do that, that we would see uh, your word uh, and its truth, and that we would let it call us to repentance and faith, and we pray that even as we read your word, we would do so to your glory. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so this is Psalm 29. It's the Psalm of David. Let's, let's read together, beginning in verse 1. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. And the voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. And may the Lord bless his people with peace. All right, before we, we dive in and sort of begin to work through it, any sort of general observations that stuck out to you as you hopefully at least had time to read it some this week and to think through it some, any, any uh, general observations, things that you want to mention uh, at the top? Hmm. The voice of the Lord. Yeah. We're at Psalm 29. It's a major theme. If you had to, to put this psalm in one of the categories that we talked about, what, what, how might you categorize this psalm? So if you think about Psalm 3 was a psalm of lament. Psalm 1, we would call a wisdom psalm, a, a Torah psalm. It talks about the word of God, walking in wisdom. Uh, what, what, what might we call this psalm if we had to put it in a category? Praise, right? Is that, is that what you said? Yeah, it's a psalm of praise, right? It's the psalmist doesn't talk about himself. Uh, he doesn't, you know, Psalm 3, right, where we looked at last week, David talks about, he begins the psalm with his enemies and what he's experiencing and what the Lord's done for him in the past and in the future and how he prayed and, right, there's, it's talking about his personal experience. This psalm, psalm 29 doesn't give us any of that, right? Psalm 29 is not focused at all on the experience of the psalmist, but instead it, it's outward. It's a psalm of praise, right? It's a psalm about the goodness and the glory of, of the Lord. Anything else that you want to mention before we, we start to work through this, this things that stick out to you? Yeah. 
a lot of great imagery in this psalm, a lot of great pictures, which we'll talk about as we work through these. What do those mean, right? What do we, why give that image? And what is that, what is he trying to convey to us as we think about that? Mm -hmm. Ascribe to the Lord, ascribe to the Lord. The voice of the Lord, right, is going to come over and over and over again. We get, uh, and then you get similar words that aren't the same. You, get, you have glory twice, but you've got splendor, which is a similar similar word, right? You've got other places that speak about uh, verse four, majesty. Is what you sort of think about we would put all glory, majesty, splendor, all kind of in the same vocabulary bucket. They're similar. Eighteen times, yeah. It's, again, it's a psalm of praise. It's not. He's not mentioning himself. It's it's pointing everything up to the Lord. What what is? There is one dominant image that I hope you've maybe you've caught as you read it this week. That the whole psalm, right? That all of these images, the the right. So the the Lord over the waters, and then the Lord breaking the cedars of Lebanon, making Lebanon to skip like a calf. There's there is an image that ties all of 29 together. All of those images that he uses are all together in one image. What, what, what is the image of Psalm 29? What is the psalmist using to represent the voice of the Lord? It's the Lord of everything, but there's a particular image. Do you know what? Have you, did, you catch, did you pick up on it? That's true. So, if you think about, well, now, one of the reasons you didn't pick up on this is because you're not from Israel. And you're not used to all the geographical clues, right? If you're a Jew, you're from Israel, you pick up on the geography of, of what this man's saying, right? You pick up on the imagery, right? If We all have things like that. And if I say, what's today's date? 9-11, right? When I say 9-11, immediately you think of things, right? My kids are just now learning about 9-11, uh, that, that they're learning uh, Henry's four, or Hen Henry's five, Elizabeth's seven, Elizabeth's talked about it some in school, and H Henry wanted to know all the things, you know, who, who, what happened to the guys who did it, had a whole discussion about Osama bin Laden, and like, okay, well, what happened to him, and the, that led us down a rabbit hole, but they're beginning to learn, right, when you hear 9-11, you immediately, your brain goes to something else, right, you, you know what that means, you think about that. If you're, you're from Israel, you live in this area, you understand the geography, you get what he's describing, if you think about uh, sort of the, the geography of, of the region, right? So this is the waters out here. And you got, I'm not an artist, so. All right, so this is, if, this, if you think about just sort of this as Israel in general, right? So what is this out here? The Mediterranean, right? What he describes, Psalm 29, is the picture of a storm that comes off the Mediterranean and goes down the length of, the, of Israel, which happens pretty regularly, right? You have a storm that begins out over the sea, and comes over and goes down. And he's using this picture of a storm to tell us something about the glory of the Lord. And to talk about the voice of the Lord. So he's going to talk about, right, the Lord thunders where first? Over the waters, right? And then he talks about breaking the cedars of Lebanon, which are up here. He makes Lebanon and Syrian, which is Mount, Syrian is Mount Hermon, right? He describes the two mountains. He makes these jump like calves, right? So you've, you've got... The storm begins here, comes here, and then it's going to go down the length, right? And then you've got the wilderness of Kadesh sort of down here to the south, right? Which is, even today, still a, a weather phenomenon that happens, right? You have a storm that begins here and comes out and sort of goes down and goes out into the, goes out into the wilderness. So he's using this image of a storm... So that's why I say all those images that we have, they're individual images, yes, but they connect to this large picture of the voice of the Lord like a storm. Uh, now, I love that he uses a storm. For most of us, if you see a storm rolling in, right, and you know it's going to be a big storm, what, if we're honest, what do we do? <laughs> 
well, go outside and watch it, right? <laughs> right? I, I remember I was, uh, gosh, I was probably in second grade. Dad wanted to watch it, and eventually my mom talked him into going under the house, and we were under the house, and uh, uh, all of a sudden I hear like, like banging on the door to the uh, to, to get under the house, and I was I thought the storm's coming to get us. He's, uh, my dad had ordered pizza, and so this poor pizza delivery boy had to come out and bring us pizza. But my dad just he just wanted to watch the storm roll in, right? When we when we see storms, one of the reasons we're fascinated by them is because they are powerful. They're big. They're grand. They they have this right booming thunder and bright lightning and heavy rain. They have this power. So this Psalm twenty nine. This David uses this image of a storm to point us to the, the voice of the Lord, to say something about the voice of the Lord. And I think what, if you read the psalm, I think he's saying that as big and grand as storms are, they're not as big as the voice of the Lord, right? That the voice of the Lord is even better, is even grander than this big thunderstorm um, that you would think of. So, again, you read you Psalm 29, we don't think, you may not have, oh, yeah, yeah, yes, that's exactly what, it. it's a storm that comes off the Mediterranean into the, right? But if you live there, and this is a pretty common phenomenon, Right, and you know where the cedars are. You know where Mount Sirion is. You know where Kadesh is. Then, oh, then the image clicks in your head really, really quickly. Does that make sense? Yeah. What study Bible do you use? Uh, I use CBS. Really? Yeah. I'm surprised. Most of them say something about yeah. this image of a storm. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, which we're going to see some of that even as we work through the, the thing. All right, so this, this makes sense. Everybody good here? This is the image, the storm coming off the Mediterranean, going down the length of Israel. It tells us something about the voice of the Lord. All right, so let's, let's begin, um, and we'll, we'll sort of work through it. There are sort of, you, you could break down this into three major sections, right? Verses 1 and 2, 3 through 9, and then, make sure I give you the right ones, 10 and 11. Right, so 1 and 2 are sort of the intro to the psalm. What is this psalm doing? What are we called to do? And then 10 and 11 are sort of the outro, right? Sort of brings the psalm to a close. And then the main body is, is and that main image of the storm is, is in verses 3 through 9. And you'll notice, again, we find, like we do in most psalms, couplets, right? Lines in parallel, the lines that go, that go together that, that, put, uh, that help to, to give us clarification as we work through the psalm. So let's look first at just verses 1 and 2. What, what do we see when we read verses 1 and 2? Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name and worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. What do you notice as we, as we look at verses 1 and 2? What, what do we see repeated? What's the call of verses 1 and 2? Ascribe, right? We can say that from the jump, right? We are to ascribe. Well, now, what, what does it mean to ascribe? It is to... Just sort of take all your words and put them together. It, it is to, to give someone the credit that is due them, right? If we ascribe to the Lord, we are saying that belongs to you, right? I'm, I'm, I'm giving you ownership of that, right? That's yours. I, I am ascribing that to you, right? So it's not just that we ascribe, but we ascribed all three times we ascribe to the Lord, right? We're to give the Lord something. Right, we're to say this belongs to you, not us. Right, we're so the psalm is about the Lord. It's pointing us to the Lord. We're we're saying something about the psalm says I, from at the very beginning. I'm telling you something about God, and not just that I'm telling you something about God, but I'm calling you to do something. Right, to to say this belongs to God, and you can give us something specific. Who does he? Who does the psalm, in in a technical sense, who is it addressed to? Oh, heavenly beings. What are the heavenly beings? What do you think? You think it's people of Israel? I think it begins with angels, but I think the call is to come join. Them. Oh, heavenly beings is, is literally sons of God. The only other time that's used in Psalm is in, I'll tell you, make sure I tell you right, uh, Psalm 89.6. We just don't see that phrase. It's here, uh, it's Job, and then it's Genesis 6. Uh, it's in Job, it's definitely angels, right? Uh, beginning of Job, remember the angels of the Lord, the sons of God come before the throne and the devil comes with them. It's clearly angels there. It's angels in, in Psalm 89. Uh, I, think, I think it's angels in Genesis 6. Uh, the, 
who knows, Genesis, Genesis 6, the sons of God, and Genesis 6, and the Nephilim, that's a whole nother, uh, that's a whole nother beast. I, I think the psalmist is doing here, what is not uncommon in the psalms, is to, you're absolutely right, the angels are already doing that. He's not telling them to do something they're not doing. It is, this is what the angels are doing. It is an invitation to come join, right? Where, where does the psalm start? If we're, we're talking about here, the psalm starts in heaven, right? The psalm starts up with what's already happening, right? O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord. But the call is, O people of Israel, come join, the, come join what is already happening in heaven, right? This, the sons of God, O heavenly beings, right? So ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. And then if you, you'll notice here, there is, there is a bit of a progression as we work through these four lines, right? Line one tells us who he's talking to, right? Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Line two tells us, right, it gives us the ascribe again, it repeats it, but then now it tells us what are we ascribing to the Lord? Glory and strength. And then line three, ascribe to the Lord, it gives us another piece of what that means. The glory do his name. You see that there's a, there's a bit of a, a progression as you move through, through these. It's not just that we're ascribing glory to God and strength to God, not just that we're saying that God is glorious and that God is strong, but that what we're giving to God is do God, right? We, we ascribe to him the glory do his name, right? We're, we're not giving God something that isn't already true of him, right? We, we use the phrase, uh, the English idiom, we use it a lot. We, we give God glory, uh, which is fine I don't, if we mean the right thing by that. Uh, we got to be careful when we talk about giving God glory. When we say that, we're not giving God something that isn't already his, as if we have some sort of glory that we can give him. To give God glory is to recognize the glory that is already there and to ascribe that glory to God, right? It's not as if we human beings have a bunch of glory that we're hoarding up and we give God some of our glory. No, to give God the glory is to say all glory belongs to God. It's to give him the glory due his name. So we're ascribing to the Lord, right? We ascribe him glory and strength. The, the Kavod is the, name, is the word for glory. It, it brings this idea of of weight and, and heaviness, right? So we're, he's saying the Lord is glorious and the Lord is strong, right? We ascribe him the glory to his name. And then what's, what, what does it finish out? What's the call in the fourth line? Worship. Right? So I, I, I would say I think that part of what the psalmist is saying is that part of what we're called to do in ascribing to the Lord, what, do you, what happens when you ascribe to the Lord? Glory and strength and the glory do his name. The call is to worship him, right? It's not to just simply say in some matter-of-fact mental assent way, I assent to the fact that God is glorious or God is strong. The call here is the call to worship the Lord, right? To come and to worship the Lord. And then we'll hit that. Does that make sense? When we, when we worship him, we know it's, you're, you're right, it is like this like spiral. The more we know of God, right, though God reveals himself to us, the more we want to love God and worship him. And the more we love God and worship him, the more we want to know of him. And it just creates this, right? And, and so it draws us in. And then he uses this last, this last phrase. We worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Right? So if you just think about what are the, the, the words that have been used of God, right? Glory, strength, glory, splendor, and, and holiness. He's telling us something about who this God is. About what we're supposed to see in verses 3 through 9, right? What, what this main image is going to give us, what's he telling us about God? Well, that he's glorious, that he's strong, that all this glory that he's going to tell us about is due God, right? That this is true of God. He's not, we're not giving to him. This is glory due his name. He's, he is owed this, right? So the, the call to worship is not then a chosen one, right? If that makes sense. It is not optional, right? The this is glory do his name. Come worship the Lord. Give him the glory that is due his name. Worship the Lord in the, in the splendor of his, of, of his holiness. Um, some of your translations, that, that phrase is kind of hard to translate. The splendor of his holiness probably means for the splendor of his holiness, right? Uh, we, we're worshiping him. Not, not that we are somehow in his splendor, but we're worshiping him. There is this, you, you think about... Uh, of pictures today. Think about the Lord. Right? What comes off that flame? 
heat and light, right? You've got, it's how we sort of think about the glory and the holiness and the splendor of the Lord. It is what emanates from him, right? It is, it is part of who he is. It's what we see coming from the light. So we're to, we're to worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness, right? For the glory, the, the majesty of who he is. Does it make sense? One and two, everybody good? Yeah. Yeah, you think about even the way he, he connects worship. Yeah. Worship and holiness. If you think about sort of what they, ha- oops, what they had to do, uh, if you lived at this time, time of David, even at the time of the tabernacle, right, where's the, where's the, the physical representation of the presence of God? It's the ark. Where is that? It's the holy of holies, right? Who goes in? Only the high priest. And how often? Once a year. And what's he do? What's he have to do before he goes in? Yeah, he's got to do all the stuff. Put on the special garments. He's got to have particular sacrifices made for himself. Uh, uh, I, I don't know about whether they were doing this yet at the time of the tabernacle, but by the time of the temple, um, the high priest would wear bells on his, uh, you know why? If he, yeah, if he drops dead, they could pull him out. They would know. They would hear, and they'd, they'd pull him out. So if you think about the holiness of God, you might be tempted to fear, right? Like, if you're living in David's time, the holiness of God might be a fearful thing, won't you? I think you're absolutely right, that the holiness here is not a fearful thing. It ought to be worship, right? That there's a splendor to, to, to it. That it. We're called to worship the Lord, not, not fear him in, the, in this way. Uh, I think the same is true when we talk about, if you use the word holiness with people now, it, it's a fearful, it's a, people don't like that word, right? It feels weird. People like to talk about the love of God, but they don't like to talk a lot about the holiness of God. We would say, no, the holiness of God is a wonderful thing, right? The love of God is a wonderful thing. All the things that we know about God are wonderful, but it, and it draws us into worship when we think about the worshiping the Lord and the splendor of his, of his holiness. And the same way that we, which is again why I think this picture of a thunderstorm is awesome, because there is this, a good thunderstorm reminds you how small you are, right? It reminds you, man, there is a, maybe I shouldn't be on the front porch watching this thing, right? Maybe I should be taking cover because there is a power there. Uh, and, and so I think that's why David picks this image uh, of, of a thunderstorm. Anything else we need to say about one and two? All right, let's, let's keep rolling. So one and two has given us the intro. What are we to do? What, are, what is this psalm about? It's about ascribing to the Lord the glory that's due his name, right? His glory, his strength, his majesty, his splendor. And then in verse 3, he, he begins uh, this image of the, the thunderstorm. The voice of the Lord is over where? First. It's over the waters. Right? So he's, he's beginning first here, right? The voice of the Lord is, is over the water. The God of glory does what? He thunders, right? He's a, it's a storm, right? It, it has this deep, booming you remember storms when, when it thunders so hard, the house shakes, you can feel the windows rattle. The voice of the Lord, the glory, the God of glory, thunders. He booms forth with, with his voice. The Lord over many waters, right? Again, I think, Pat, I think it was you mentioned, he, he, he just talks about the Lord again and again and again. The voice of the Lord, the God of glory. And he says the Lord again. I want to pause here for a second, and let's talk about this phrase, the voice of the Lord. What is the voice of the Lord? All right, that's, the, that's the picture. He's using the storm to tell us something about the voice of God. He's going to come back to the voice of the Lord again and again. The voice of the Lord does this. The voice of the Lord does that. What is, what is talk about the voice of the Lord. What is the voice of the Lord? Right? John 1.1. 1, 1. Right, what does John 1.1 1, 1 say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? When we talk about the voice of the Lord, what other... Ways. Pat, I think you mentioned this a minute ago. Where, what other places do we see the voice of the Lord in the Bible? In Revelation? Where else? You mentioned creation, right? How is everything created? You spoke it into being, right? It, it created by the voice of the Lord, right? How does Hebrews 1 say that the Lord holds together basically all the cosmos? The word of his power, right? It's by his voice that he holds everything together. Right, so when we think about the voice of the Lord, we, we could sort of put these in, in, some, in some categories. Uh, I'm running out of space here. Where do we see the voice of the Lord? We see it 
sort of number one in the world, meaning in creation, created all things. Lord, we see his voice in, in the world. Uh, you could call this general revelation. All men that have ever lived have access to general revelation, right? It, is, it tells us about some about who God is. It is enough to condemn us. It is not enough to save us, right? So we see some of the power of the voice of the Lord in creation, in our, in our world, right? In the things that God has made, in us, in, in nature, in animals, and all the things that God has made, we see the power of the voice of the Lord. Everything that came into being has come into being because God spoke it into being. We can't speak anything into being, and everything that ever was has come into being because God has spoken into being. And then right now, the fact that all of our bodies, all the atoms in our bodies hold together, they are held together by the voice of the Lord, by divine fiat. It is God who holds us together, okay? He holds all the, the cosmos together. We see it, number two, in the word, right? In the Bible. When the prophets, when the Lord comes to the prophets and gives them a message, and then the prophets would come to the people of Israel or whoever they were speaking to, if that was Israel or sometimes it was the enemies of Israel, how almost always do they introduce this message from the Lord? Thus, thus saith the Lord, right? Right, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah don't come and say, it seems to me like I'd like to tell you all some things. No, they come and say, thus saith the Lord, right? This is what God says. That they, they bring a particular message from God, and they say, this, this is what the Lord has said. This is what the word of God. Every word of the Bible is the word of God. It is God speaking to us. So we see it in general revelation, the word of the voice of the Lord and what God has made, but we see it in what God has revealed to us, right? So we might call this, Special revelation. General revelation gives us enough knowledge about God to condemn us, but not enough to be saved. You can't look at a tree or a mountain and come to the understanding that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and was crucified for you and come to repentance and faith. You, you must have the word to do that, right? This is why we take the gospel to the ends of the earth, because we have, we have a, a true and steady word, right? We, the Lord has revealed himself to us. He has told us who we are, who he is, what he's like, how we're to be saved, what's going to happen. Right? He, he's told us where we come from, where we're going, everything we need to know. God has revealed that to us in his word. Right? The, the word of God is the voice of the Lord. I, uh, I think, I don't remember who it was. I think it was Piper who would say, he, people would always say to him, I just want to hear the Lord audibly speak to me. And he would say, well, fine, go read your Bible out loud. Right? <laughs> It's, that is the voice of the Lord. It is, it is the word of God. So when we think about this phrase, voice of the Lord, it's his creative power. It's his revelation to us. Uh, and then you mentioned the, the, sort of the third way we might think about this. Who is the Logos? It's Christ, right? That's John 1, the Logos, the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. How do we know who God is, Right? We know him from the word, from his creation. We know him from the word, from what he's revealed to us. We know him in Christ, right? Christ is God incarnate, incarnate, fully God, fully man. He has revealed the Father to us, right? That's why Jesus can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Right? That he, he reveals to us who God is. So think about sort of the full-orbed way in which we think about the voice of the Lord. Think about the total person and acts of God, right? The voice of the Lord booms over the waters. The God of glory thunders. Right? That's talking about all the works of God. What he's done in the world, in creation, what he does, has told us in his word. Ultimately, I think what he's revealed to us in, in Christ. This is, we think about the voice of, of the Lord. Does this make sense? Okay. Uh, let's, let's go back. So the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over, over many waters. Right? He begins that picture uh, of the Lord over the uh, For, and he, he, he gives us two descriptions of the voice of the Lord to sort of begin to tell us about this thunderstorm. All right, so you've got the voice of the Lord again, both times. And then what are the two descriptors he gives us? Powerful and full of majesty. All right, so powerful takes us back up to he's described strength already. We're to give glory and strength, to ascribe glory and strength to the Lord. There's a power. Again, he's telling us something about the thunderstorm. It's powerful. And what is majesty, right? It is full of majesty. What's majesty? 
beauty. I, I, I definitely think beauty is part of that. Awe. Where do we, where do, what, what, where do you often see the word majesty? Kings. Royal, right? Kings and queens. Uh, I forget, I don't remember where I read this, but somebody described majesty once to find it as royal beauty. Right? It is beauty, but there's a regalness to it, right? Right, when you, you see the queen, right? God save the king. When you see the queen, you say your majesty, right? There's a majesticness to that, right? There's a beauty. There's a royal beauty. Again, if you think about a, 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 a storm, Storm has both power, but again, why are we drawn to storms? Because there, strangely, is a beauty there, right? There is a, we look at the strength of storms and the thunder, right? And there is a, there's a beauty to it, right? There's a majesty, majesty to it. He said, this is, this is what's true of the voice of the Lord. It's, it's power, but it's not just simply brute force, right? The Bible does not describe a God who is just simply force, right? That, that's what the pagan gods are, right? The gods of the Greeks and the Romans, the strong ones, are basically brute force, right? They have very little morals, they have very little wisdom, very little love, compassion, mercy, any of those other things. They're just, what is Zeus? Zeus is force. The God of the Bible is not simply brute force. He's powerful, yes, but he's full of majesty. There's a beauty there, right? There is a, a, a royal, regal beauty, right? The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty, right? He's, he's telling us not just that the Lord is powerful, but that there, we should see some beauty in the Lord. We should recognize that in his power and glory, there's, there's great beauty to, be, to behold, right? So he's begun out o- over the waters. Everybody good? Yeah, so there's lots of debate. There are uh, Canaanite and Phoenician psalms that are similar to psalm 29 and so there's debate about whether david is intentionally taking one of well whether david was aware of those or had seen those and it's intentionally takes that canaanite psalm and says well no i'm gonna i'm gonna sort of adopt that and change it and make it about the real god of thunder now the timing of that some people will say absolutely i think that's what david did some people say well, no i don't think that necessarily david did that i don't know i don't know where i either way certainly i do think baal is the god of thunder whether or not David is borrowing a, a psalm that already existed in, in Canaanite culture and then he just adapts it and says, no, no, let me tell you about the real God of thunder. Whether that's true, I, I don't know. I definitely think that this is saying, you think you know the God of thunder. We know the real God of thunder, right? That he's, it is, it's not Baal. It's Yahweh. It's the, the God of Israel is the one whose voice thunders over all, all the waters. And you'll notice even as we finish, he finishes not with just simply what this means for Israel, but he talks about the sovereignty of God over all of creation, over the Israelites, over the Canaanites, over all the ites, right? That the, the Lord, the voice of the Lord thunders over all of his creation. And that's a good point. I'm glad you reminded me of that. I almost forgot that. Yeah, so you're right. Baal is the god of thunder. Um, there's some really interesting literature if you want to read um, some really interesting Phoenician and Canaanite psalms um, that are similar, right? That, that have similar language. Just not, they're not written about Yahweh. They're written about Baal and other, God, other Canaanite gods. Uh, and there, theologically, there's no issue, right? If, if David, on the, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, takes a Phoenician psalm or a Canaanite psalm and says, you write about what you don't know. Or, I'm going to take this, I'm going to adapt it, I'm going to change it, and I'm going to make it about the, the one true God. I'm, I'm going to make it write it about Yahweh. There's, no, there's nothing wrong about that. Uh, in the same way, anybody heard of like the Epic of Gil- Gilgamesh? Right? There's tons of, of flood stories in all sorts of different cultures. Uh, and some people have tried to say, well, what that tells us then is that the Bible is not true because all of these different cultures have a flood story and clearly the Bible has just ripped off those stories. And No, I, I think it actually says the opposite. I think that, I think that what, what that tells you is that there was really a flood and that all the different cultures of the world are finding a way to try to grapple with that flood and they're writing their own stories to try to make sense of a global flood, which I think leads, leads credence to. The Bible is actually the real account of that and everybody's wrestling with it. So... I'm not troubled at all. If David does sort of copy a Phoenician or Canaanite song, we have no problem with that. David's still doing that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's taking it. He's adapting it. He's making it about the Lord instead of about. Yeah, if he did it, the, Lord, the Holy Spirit told him to do it. And so I've got no, got no problems there. I don't think, I don't, you know, there are good cases made on both sides. I just, I don't think you can know for sure. Um, that's like. Uh, all the lawsuits that happen today where one, one artist sues another artist because this beat sounds similar. So it's just, who knows? You know, there's only so many things under the sun. Uh, so everything's going to sound 
alike eventually. Uh, so whether David is intentionally copying a Canaanite psalm, I don't know. But I do think that this is pushing back against the God of thunder, Baal, Baal, however you want to say it, um, that God himself is the Lord of thunder. It's a great point, Pat. All right, anything else for three and four? All right, it's begun the image, the Lord is the storm over the waters. All right, verse five. The, lo- the voice of the Lord, there it is again, breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon, right? So where have we moved now? Right? We've, we've moved up here. If you, what do you know about the cedars of Lebanon? You've seen those. Have you seen that other places in the scriptures? What, what were they? They were massive, massive trees. Yeah, massive. They were used to building the temple. They were like, they were sort of the most coveted wood building material in the in the region, right? Anybody been to like the redwood forest in California? I've not been there, but I've seen pictures, right? You just, you think we've got big trees until you see big trees, right? These cedars, you, you got trees you can drive through, right? Uh, so these cedars, you know, we think even ancient cedars, some of them might have been as tall as 130 feet, 145 feet. I mean, just massive trees, 40, 40 to 45, maybe even larger in diameter. I mean, you're talking just massive, massive trees. So they were coveted for their size and their strength, right? So lots of people used them. They were used to build the temple. But they were coveted building materials because they were huge and because they were really, really, really strong, right? So that they are become, even in other Psalms and in the Old Testament and other places, they're a picture for what? you think? Strength, right? The cedars of Lebanon are massive, right? They're big, strong trees. That's why everybody wants to build them, because they're big, and they're strong, and they're tough. And it says, all right, so the storm starts out here over the waters, which I didn't mention this. In the Old Testament, the water, water, especially the sea, the ocean, almost always represents chaos. It's chaos and judgment. God judges the world. How does he judge it? With a flood, Right? You think about the ways when you think about uh, even baptism. I'm going to baptize somebody today, right? What does water represent in baptism? It represents death, right? It represents the judgment of God. We go under the water, right? The waters were seen, especially by the Israelites, as a place of chaos. And the psalmist says, the Lord of glory thunders over it, right? He, he thunders over what, what is seen as the place of, of deep darkness and chaos and scariness, right? The Lord, th- the Lord thunders over it. He's sovereign over it, even that. And then he moves into landfall, and he goes to these great big cedars, and what does he do to them? He snaps them. The Lord breaks the cedars. He breaks the cedars of Lebanon, right? You've seen uh, 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 telephone poles get snapped in storms. It takes a lot for a telephone pole to get snapped in a storm. Imagine how big a storm would have to be to, to snap these. I think that's a pine tree. I don't know that that's what they look like. Uh, <coughs> uh, yeah, I don't. I don't, know, I don't know if that's what they looked like or not, but you've got to think about how, what sort of force a storm would have to have to not just, like, knock some limbs off, but the idea, the picture here is he's snapping them, right? Like, you and I would snap a matchbook, right? We, we can snap a match. It's nothing to you. The Lord of glory, he thunders over the waters, right? He's sovereign even over the chaos out here. But then he comes in, he breaks the cedars, right? The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. What, what might this tell us, right? If this is, right, the Lord of glory, he's powerful, he's majestic, he's sovereign even over the chaos, what might the psalmist be saying about the Lord here? Yeah, wherever the, wherever the Lord is, the Lord is powerful, right? If these are symbols of strength, then the Lord comes and he snaps them, right? Is there anything the Lord can't do? No. He is in full control. He is full of glory and power and majesty, right? There's nothing the Lord can't do. He is, he is stronger than anything you could think of, right? This picture of symbol or this symbol of power and strength, the Lord rolls through and it's nothing, what we think is powerful and strong and steady and will never fall, the Lord laughs at, right? You just think about all the things that you think of, that you, that you think are so steady, the things that you put your hope and trust in that just are not steady, right? You, you think about your health, you think about governments, you think about all the civilization, all the things that seem so steady to us. The Lord laughs, and those, those things aren't steady, right? The Lord, I'll snap those in a second. The Lord is strong. There's nothing as strong as the Lord, uh, that he, he rules the unruly out here. He breaks the unbreakable, right? What, what is impossible for us is not impossible for the Lord. The Lord uh, can do whatever he wants. Any, any more we need to say on five? All right, next, next picture. 
verse, uh, verse 6. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. All right, so you've got Lebanon and Syrian. Syrian is Mount Hermon. All right, so you've got two little, you've got lots of sort of mountain ranges up here, but, but two little clumps of mountains. We say mountains. These are more like eastern Kentucky mountains than they are like the Rocky Mountains. They're hills, but they're, mount, they're mountains, but they're just, they're not the Rockies. Uh, so you've got, uh, uh, I believe, if I'm thinking correctly, Lebanon and Syrian, or could have those mixed. I think this is Hermon, and that's Lebanon. All right, so we've got these mountain, right, these hills, these mountains. And what does he make them do? They skip like a calf on like a young wild ox. What's the picture there? And you're going to get another picture of that in verse 9, right, when he makes the deer give birth. Uh, again, there's a translation issue. I, I think the deer give, gives birth is the right translation. You've got the same picture. Along with that, 6, you've got this picture, not just of, of birth, which I think is there, but this picture of, right, what, what are calves and young wild ox? Are they big? They're, they're small, right? The Lord's moving them, right? They're skipping, right? They're, he's, you ever uh, spooked a calf and seen them jump, right? What, he's describing what? Mountain ranges. The Lord is, right, he rules the unruly. He breaks the unbreakable. He moves the immovable, right? These big, powerful mountains. The voice of the Lord booms. What do they do? They give birth. They skip. Or they, he, they're like, he's like a, this Herman is like a young wild ox, right? It's not like a big, powerful mountain. It's like a young wild ox, right? It, it, is, it, it is jumping before the Lord that there is this picture again of the, the sovereignty, the power, the strength of the Lord, as opposed to what seems, again, if you thought the cedars were strong and powerful, Hermon and Syrian, I mean, Hermon and Lebanon seem, they're mountains, right? They're not going anywhere. They're big and powerful and strong. The Lord makes them jump, like, makes them skip like a calf or like a young, like a young wild ox. Hermon has an N on the end, sorry. Uh, we're good to go to verse 7. All right, the voice of the Lord, we, we see that again. Flashes forth like flames of fire. What is that? Lightning, right? Once you see the storm image, then you, you get all, it makes, makes total sense. What, what does lightning look like? It's flames of fire. He flashes forth like flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. And then he tells us in the back half, right, he, he shakes the wilderness of, of, of Kadesh. Right, so the it has moved now the length uh, of Israel right, down into the down into the, the wilderness uh, of Kadesh, right? So you've got this picture of these flames of fire, the Lord bursting forth. Lightning is powerful; it's loud, even right. If you hear a crack of lightning, um, it is. You ever been in storms where just sort of the whole sky is just lighting up with lightning? That's why I love summer storms, because you get, you get tons of lightning. That the voice of the Lord flashes forth with flames of fire. Again, it's a picture of power, right? Of strength, of even beauty. Lightning is beautiful. There's a majesty there, even though it can be destructive, right? Lightning has great power for destruction, and yet there's still a beauty there. The, Lord, sort of the voice of the Lord, it flashes forth like flames of fire. It shakes the wilderness, it shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. So you've got sort of got some desert, but there is we think when you think wilderness, it is both when you're down here in this area, we think of Israel as just like there's just all dirt, right? It's just, just desert everywhere. It's just not that way. There are deserts, but there's also there's there's life, there's vegetation. There it's not just sand everywhere. Uh, and you do have forest, right? You do when you say when you hear wilderness, that doesn't necessarily mean desert or forest. It, it is a broader term. Um, so he's not saying simply the desert or simply the forest. When you move further down into the peninsula, then you're going to get way more sort of desert, desert. Um, but there are wildernesses here, right? So this is the, the region, um, uh, uh, like in Gedi, when uh, David uh, cuts off the corner of Saul's robe. Uh, he's hiding in, or in Gedi's in this region. You've got some really beautiful places there, um, so there, there is wilderness here that is desert. There's some that's, uh, that's trees. But the picture is the voice of the Lord, the thunder and the lightning booming, and the whole wilderness shakes, right? Again, we, we mentioned you feel the, when your windows rattle when the thunder happens. Uh, imagine how loud thunder would have to be for all the wilderness to shake, where everything is moved by the thunder, everything shakes. And then he, I, I think then verse 9, 
is a, is a continuation of this picture of the shaking of the wilderness, right? The voice of the Lord makes the deer to give birth. I'm glad you mentioned your, your, your time working in maternity ward, because uh, people always think this is such a strange image. And in some ways, in some ways it, is, it is a strange image. It's not what we would think of. The Lord makes the, makes the, deer, uh, makes the de- deer to give birth. Uh, there is a slight, uh, there is a translation issue. issue. Uh, your Bibles probably, mention, probably have a footnote um, that says revocalization could also could cause it to be translated, makes the oaks to shake. Uh, so well, what he means by that is, we'll do a quick Hebrew lesson. So Hebrew has consonants, right? These are main, so this is yod Hey vav Hey. This is the word Yahweh. Right? You'll always see it written like this, like this uh, without any vowels. Um, original Hebrew and modern Hebrew. If you go to Israel right now, you're not going to see vowels. These are consonants. These are not vowels. This is essentially Y-H and then a V slash W-H. And in Hebrew, uh, even in modern Hebrew, if you go to Israel right now, you're not going to see vowels. You're, they're written this way. And you just learn to read it. Right? You learn, when you learn Hebrew, even as, right now, you go to Israel, you're small Jewish boy, you're learning how to read, you're going to learn how to read. Even though the vowels aren't there, you know which vowels go. They teach you grammatical rules of what vowels to put in. Now, uh, so the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, and then the Masoretes come and eventually realize, well, not everybody knows Hebrew, and the Masoretes come with a pointing system, right? Uh, and then uh, basically put in put in vowels, right? So I'm going to put a, vowels, a bunch of vowels that don't go here. But they, they put these little dots, and right, you can have stuff that goes above it, stuff that goes in between, stuff that goes below, that represent the vowels, right? For people who, don't, who aren't native Hebrew speakers, right? That help us to read the Hebrew, right? The Masoretes were Hebrew speakers, but they did this for the, sakes of other, for the sake of other people. So when you see what it says, revocalization, what that means is sometimes putting different vowels in gives us a different word, if that makes sense, right? So if you put, you can put some different vowels into that phrase, and it comes out, it makes the oaks to shake. Now, the reason why I think makes the deer give birth is that, one, that, that's the older translation, but two, it's difficult. One of the key principles is most of the time, the harder reading is probably the correct reading. Right? What, what would seem stranger that makes the deer to give birth or makes the oak to shake? Now, why do we say the harder reading is, is almost always the correct one? It is, way, it is way easier to understand why a scribe at some point would say, makes the deer give birth? That doesn't make sense. I think somebody messed up the vows here. I think this is supposed to be makes the oak to shake. Why somebody would, would think that there was a mistake and then shift to makes the oak to shake rather than makes the deer to give birth. You're almost never going to see a scribe make a change from easy to understand to harder to understand. The harder to understand one is almost always the correct one because then it makes sense of why a scribe would look at that. No scribe's going to read makes the oaks to shake and say, well, that's weird. I think this, I'm going to change this to, no, but a scribe at some point might, make, might think, oh, that's an error, right? That's some, somebody, got the, somebody got the vowels wrong here. I'm going to fix that. Uh, and that's why you end up with stuff in, in some uh, manuscript families. So I think, all that to say, I think makes the voice, the Lord makes the, the verse of the Lord makes the deer to give birth is the correct translation. I think it was exactly what you talked about. There is this picture of the power of the Lord, right? That this storm rolling through, the deer in the wilderness gives birth, right? There is this such power that rolls through. And then he strips the forest bare, right? Sort of. Um, You've seen those videos of when, like, the A-bombs go off and they're testing the A-bombs and you've got the trees and the houses and what happens? Just, whoosh, right? They're just all stripped bare. Anything that's left, any trees that are left standing are just stripped. There's just nothing left on them. That's the image, right? That the, This whole wilderness, deer gives birth, and everything is stripped bare. Does that make sense? Everybody get the pictures? All right, and what, what's he end verse 9 with? And all in his temple cry out glory, right? So remember, this is the call, is to praise the Lord. Right? The temple is 
the earthly dwelling place of God. It's the, where the physical representation of the presence of God is. And the psalmist says, in light of this, the voice of the Lord that we see described is coming all the way out of the sea and over the land and down the wilderness. It described all the ways and the power and the majesty and the strength of the voice of the Lord. And he says, what is the response? What should be the response to this? In his temple, his people cry out, glory, right? There's, there's we're just, he's saying, people do what I've called you to do in verses 1 and 2, to describe to the Lord glory. And all his people cry out, glory. They, they praise the Lord, right? Anything else we need to say about 3 through 9 for the moment? Got the picture? All right, let's, let's do the outro. So he ends the psalm. The Lord sits enthroned, enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned forever. As king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people, and may the Lord bless his people with peace. We've got two couplets. Think about these for a moment. All right. So he ends the psalm talking about who God is, right? He's told us about the voice of the Lord. He ends with this picture The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. Now, one, when you have big storms pop up, what, what often do they bring? bring floods, right? They bring, they dump a ton of water. They bring destruction. I find it interesting that David doesn't just say the Lord sits enthroned over a flood. He says the Lord sits enthroned over what? The flood. You don't see that in the old Hebrew Old Testament hardly ever, right? That phrase, the flood, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. In fact, you only see that phrase, the flood, one other time in the Bible. In the Hebrew Old Testament, where? Genesis 6, right? There's the flood. It, it is, what, what, what was the flood in Genesis? It was judgment, right? It was the Lord judging the earth for its wickedness and saving Noah and his family through the ark. But it was a picture of the judgment of God, right? The flood was not just the judgment of God, but it, the flood was a picture that God was sovereign over all creation. This was his creation. He could do with it what he wants. And God could judge the, the earth, right? God could, it's his to do what he wants. He sits enthroned over flood. Who is the Lord the judge over? Everybody, right? He's not, he's not the judge of Israel. He's not the judge just of the Canaanites. The Lord is the judge over every single human being because the Lord is the judge over all creation because that's his creation. The Lord, right, having used this voice of the Lord, he's described for us the Lord moving over the territory of Israel, but he says the Lord sits enthroned over it all, right? He sits enthroned over the flood. I think this is a picture of the, the sovereignty and the judgment of God. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as a king forever, Right? He's sovereign over Israel. He's judge of Israel, but he's judge of the Canaanites, the Phoenicians, all the ites, all the peoples of the world. God is judge over them. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood, over all of the people. Right? That is a picture here of God's judgment, of God's sovereignty, of God's reign. And then verse 11, may the Lord give strength to his people and may the Lord bless his people with peace. If 10 focuses on sort of the, the broader aspect right, of God's reign, he's over the flood, he's enthroned as a king forever, then I, I think you have a narrowing when you come to verse 11, right? That there is a differenti differentiation. That's a hard word for me. Uh, he's drawing a difference, making a difference between all the peoples of the world and who? What does verse 11 talk about? Who does verse 11 talk about? His people, right? May the Lord give strength to his people, and may the, may the Lord bless his people with peace, Right? You think about what we've, just, what, what we've looked at in all of this psalm. You've got this picture of power and strength. He rules the unruly. He breaks the unbreakable. He moves the immovable. He shakes what, what cannot be shaken. God does what nobody else can do. And then he says, and the Lord's judge over all. He sits enthroned over the flood. He's a king and a king forever. Whether or not Psalm 29 is good news to you, it's gonna, that's all going to hang on one question. What's that question? What makes Psalm 29 good news to you? What makes it bad news to you? If you're his people, right? If you're his people, then the storm is big and strong and powerful, but it's your storm. You know him, and he knows you, right? This is your storm. 
if you're not his people? What does that mean for you? Judgment, right? Where can you hide from this storm? Where can you go? Can Baal save you from this storm? No, right? The, the, right, the whether or not Psalm 29 is good news for you is going to be determined by whether or not you are his people, whether or not you're found in the Lord, right? May the Lord give strength to his people. You think about this. Sorry, I'm writing all over everything. I'll do a different color. This is both in Hebrew and in English. This is the last word of the psalm. The last word of the psalm is peace. You find some irony there? Would you describe what we've read about this storm from starting out here all the way down? Would you, read, would you think about that storm and say, oh, man, that's a peaceful storm? No, there's a bit of an irony that he has described the beauty and the glory and the power and the strength of this storm. And yet, he says, this storm for his people, for God's people, brings what? Peace. And there's a peace that comes with being the people of God. And know that this God is on our side. Right? This is our God. We know the one true God, and we're, we're, we are his people. Right? So there's a beauty even to the judgment of God. Right? There's a beauty to the fact that this Lord is ours. Now, one of the questions we always want to ask, as we, we think through these things, we ask, we've asked this with every psalm, how does this psalm then point us to Christ? <laughs> yeah. yeah, Jesus with his, how does he call it? With his word. Right? With this word, the winds and the waves obey him. And that's what his disciples say. Who is this? Who is this guy? Right? It points us to Christ. Now, you think about, even think about what we just talked about. If we want to be his people, how is it that we might be the people of God? It's only through Christ, right? If we want to, there is a storm coming. And we all agree that, right? That there is judgment. Judgment is coming. Right? What is the only way that we will survive the coming judgment. There's no other God that can save us, right? God rules the unruly. He breaks the unbreakable. He moves the immovable. He shakes what can't be shaken. There's no hiding from the coming judgment. There's nothing we can do in and of ourselves. If we're going to be his people, it's only going to be through the personal work of the Lord Jesus. It's the one who calms the winds and the waves. It's the one who says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest, right? What's he pray for his people? May the Lord bless his people with, with peace, the I would argue the, the, the Greek word rest is the, the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew shalom. There's a, a peace. There's a rest that's only going to come in the person, the work uh, of the Lord Jesus. All right, we've got a couple minutes. Anything, we need to, anything you want to say as, now as we've worked through it, ways that you might think of application? We've asked with the other psalms, try to think through ways that you could use this psalm uh, in your own life or for the sake of others, right? So if you remember Psalm 3, how could you use Psalm 3 to, to comfort somebody in the midst of suffering? What, what's, what, think through some of the application of Psalm 29. Yeah, yeah. If we, if we put our hope in this God, what should scare us? Nothing, right? If our hope is in this God, what really should shake our confidence? No, nothing, really. Right? We can, I think there's a way to have concern for the things that are going on in the world, and that's just part of being a good person human being and that God has made us in community and we care about our world, we care about those things, but we shouldn't ever lose our mind. Right? We, right there's, a, there's elections coming up this fall. There's going to be another presidential election. There's just stuff. We lose our minds about all sorts of stuff. If this is our God, if our God is this God, he rules over everything, right? He's stronger than anything. He, he moves what can't be moved. He shakes what can't be shaken. If this is our God, what in this life should really shake my confidence in that? Absolutely nothing, right? There is, this also tells me, if I get cancer tomorrow, one, it has not come to me outside of the hand of God because he rules everything. But two, that's why I have hope that I could pray. We, we, we prayed Wednesday night. The pastors prayed over somebody who has an illness, surgery coming up. We, we laid hands and prayed over him. I have confidence to do that because I trust the Lord can do that. What is hard for us, right, when doctors say there's no way, there is nothing we can do, well, we say, well, that's fine. There's nothing you can do, yeah. But we trust the one who breaks the unbreakable. Well, yeah, the Lord is powerful. The Lord has strength that we, that we do not. That's why I have hope and confidence when, when we pray. That's why I pray for my kids. Not because I think I have any power, because the Lord has power. Right? If, that is, if this is the Lord that we serve, and we are his people in Christ, man, what confidence we should have in the world. Right? What confidence, what, what, what hope 
what unshaking, unwavering, ballast in the boat sort of uh, confidence we should have day by day that regardless of what comes, we're not rocked. We don't lose our minds. We're not overly grieved or mourning about all the things that are happening in the world because this is our God and nothing shakes that. Nothing can undo the story. Yeah, I think it's a great point. Peter takes his eyes off Jesus and yet Jesus is still kind and gracious and doesn't let him drown, right? He, he, yeah, he, he, yeah, he picks him back up. He takes him, again, where does that happen? Over the waters, right? Over the, the chaotic, scary place. Uh, and it was a big deal. God doesn't let him drown. It is helpful to know if there's shaking that's on our part, right? It's not because the Lord is not a firm foundation. That's why I think, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. It's a good prayer, right? Uh, Lord, I help me to see this. Help, help me to rest in this. Help me to trust this. Because uh, I don't always, even though I know it's true. It's good. Anybody else? All right, well, let me pray for us, and uh, we'll head to service. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the way in which we've seen your word work, uh, for creating us, for creating all the world, for the beauty that you've put in this world. Uh, Father, we thank you for what you've given to us uh, in the Bible. You did not leave us in the darkness, but you spoke to us. You revealed yourself to us, and you have shown us your son. And Father, we thank you that you have, uh, at just the right time, sent your son to die for sinners, uh, that we do not deserve to be your people. Uh, But in grace and mercy, you have made us ours. We were not your people. We had not been shown mercy, but now we are your people, and we have been shown mercy in Christ. And so, Father, we praise you, and we want to give you the glory that is due your name for your your majesty and your strength and your power and your holiness. And, Father, we pray that you would give us eyes to see you in all of your glory, that we would rest not in our own strength or our own strategies, but we would rest in you and your sovereign care of us. Father, we pray that even as we go to service today, we pray to you because we know you hear our prayers and you answer us. And so we ask that as we we worship, uh, that you would help us in everything we, we say and do and read and think, that you would be glorified, that we would worship you in the splendor of your holiness, that those who are with us would see a crucified and risen Savior lifted up in glory, that they would be drawn to that sort of Savior, uh, both in holiness and in mercy. Father, we pray that as the word is preached, that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear, that you would help us, give us wisdom, help us to understand your word, help us not to hide from it or to to harden our hearts to it, but to hear your word and to believe and to run to you in repentance and faith. We pray for our pastor, pray you'd give him clarity of thought and speech, uh, that even as you have worked uh, in him and through him uh, this week as he studied, we pray you'd work in him and through him in the pulpit, that you would uphold him with your righteous right hand, give him strength, give him boldness, give him grace and compassion uh, that he might proclaim a crucified and risen Savior uh, to dying sinners, that we might see that Savior and run to him in faith. We thank you for all that you have done for us and that you, uh, by the Holy Spirit, pray better prayers than we are able to, that you know what we need before we ever ask it. And so, God, we ask that you would give us what we need even when we are too foolish to ask for it. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.